What's up guys, I'm Chris Lado. Welcome, today is a deep dive into the Omaha event. So this crazy event that went over the course of three or four days back in July of 2019, here right off the coast of San Diego, about 100 miles. This is a crazy event that shows there's so many sensors on these objects and it's over such a long period of time, what you get is corroborating data from all these different sensors that make it very, very compelling that there's a ton of evidence across these three different videos. And primarily I'm gonna focus on the radar video released by Jeremy Corbell, uh, the thermal video, which is just mind blowing to me. And then this final video is the optical video uh, that was recently released by Jeremy Corbell. So those three videos actually, if they, the third one can be confirmed by the Navy that it was taken by personnel. Now those will be three videos of the same event in three different mediums. So we know we have radar tracking it, thermal video of it, and then we have optical video as well, along with witness accounts. So very strong, super strong case. And I mean, the thermal video is just mind blowing. If you like the content, please like, and subscribe. It really helps out the channel. And then join the conversation in the comments. Let's get right to the video. Six foot in diameter sphere uh, floated alongside the Omaha for about an hour, just followed along where the ship went. And they got all these images, recorded the images until at 11 o'clock at night, July 15th, this thing dipped into the water. And that, that sent the, the crew into sort of a, a routine. They announced something to the effect of splash, splash, which marked the spot where the thing went in. They conducted a search looking for wreckage. There was none there. It disappeared from sonar and radar, and this thing was just gone. So that was George Knapp from Mystery Wire. There's a lot of information on that. This, is, this website is actually from Jeremy Corbell's website, Extraordinary Beliefs. And what here is, there's a lot of information. So what's interesting about this, this most recent video, okay, so from the actual optical video, you can't get too much out of it, but there is a ton of information surrounding or related to this event. So you can get it from there. You can also go to Mystery Wire as well. So visual information personnel teams recorded the video and they provide visual documentation of unsafe, unprofessional, abnormal interactions by the vessels and or aircraft of other nations against US assets, helping us win the narrative battle. So that's what they do is collect information so that we can win the narrative battle against other like civilian vessels or nations, if there's any incidents or something. This gives you an idea uh, a Viper team documents and transmits their visual information products to higher headquarters and according to a prescribed set of timelines. Team members must be trained in their roles and cross-trained when possible to ensure the mission can succeed. So they have a team lead, uh, they have a photographer, a videographer, uh, editor, processor, and then a recorder and narrative writer. So basically a team of these uh, people to go around and make sure they're collecting all the information and passing it up to higher headquarters. All right, and they were on board the Omaha. I mean, look at this thing. This, these ships are so crazy looking. This was my favorite picture of the Omaha. I mean, look at that thing, man. This is the ship we make. Amazing. And so this was built in 2015, the actual Omaha. I'm not sure if this is a picture of the Omaha itself, but it's an independence class, a littoral combat ship. So these are the ships you want if you are going to be a Bond villain, you want this and maybe a submarine. So I was able to find a few other pictures actually when I look around uh, online. I found this one, I mean a little different, I, it didn't seem correct. There's another angle. Uh, yeah, so the, the, it's kind of weird what it, the angle it's looking from. Here's a better, yeah, so basically goes to here. So this is the Independence class warship. The USS Omaha, there's tons of information on Wikipedia. I mean, Wikipedia is just, it's just amazing information age we live in. So the Omaha is a independence class littoral combat ship. Small seas, it only drafts 14 feet. That just seems amazing to me. It's a uh, 420 feet long. We can round up in that case. You know, it can carry helicopters. So this is an independence class warship, similar to the uh, Omaha. You see here, it's got its main gun up here. It has these strike missiles. Uh, it has its phalanx defense system and it can land helicopters. It's a trimaran, right? What, a, what a, a crazy machine. The Navy doesn't use this ship for touring. Okay, this is a, a combat system. You know, I've fought ships a few times in my career, defended uh, ships during exercises. And what I've learned fighting ships and defending ships is you just never, ever, ever want to attack a ship essentially, if you want to live. Right? You really need long range missiles that can shoot hundreds of miles 
over the horizon much further because ships are extremely, extremely lethal and dangerous. I mean, ships are dangerous. The only thing that I think that can destroy a ship is a submarine, okay? So uh, in that case, unless you have tons of missiles, long range, exosets, etc. So ships are like very fast, maneuverable tanks, integrated tanks with tons and tons of equipment. I mean, you can load anything onto a ship essentially, and each one of these systems integrates and works together. So if we look here, this is right at the top of the ship, uh, and I'll go through a little bit more in detail here, but this is the FLIR system. So that thermal camera that we're seeing, that thermal image is coming right from, from this thing. I'll show you a better picture uh, in a little bit. And then this is your phalanx. So this, this also has a radar on it. This is that 20 millimeter cannon that defends a ship against guns, etc. All these things are linked, okay, in certain ways. So, you know, if the, if the radar picks up some inbound missile coming towards the ship, it will link to the phalanx and tell the phalanx to look in that direction, okay, with different radars. Ships are just bristling, literally bristling with uh, high-tech equipment. And this was made in 2015, so it's gonna have the newest uh, tech uh, in the Navy. Here's another picture of the Omaha. So this is actually the Omaha from Wikipedia. Uh, and if we zoom up here again, okay, this is the ship cockpit. <laughs> uh, this is the bridge. And then this is that FLIR camera, okay? So FLIR, it's up pretty high, right? Because they want to put those sensors as high as they can, right? The antenna mass height on a ship is very important. They want to get as high as they can for their sensors because the ERP is curved, right? So you can only see as far, the higher you get, the further you can see. So that's why they want to put these sensors up uh, as high as they can up on, on the ship. So this is that FLIR. FLIR Star Sapphire 3, there are newer versions of this, okay, and FLIR, in my mind, stands for forward-looking infrared radar, but they stole it. It's kind of like Kleenex, okay, so this FLIR is a name of, uh, of the company, Teledyne FLIR. There are newer ones, okay, but I think based off, if you look at the actual Omaha picture here, if you, if you count the little circles, uh, I think what we're actually looking at here is the FLIR Star Sapphire 3 is what they are using normally hangs on the bottom of a helicopter, all right, or aircraft. So this is what it was designed for, is to hang upside down, or this is the right side, I guess, and on the ship it's upside down. Um, but now you can get information on the field of view. Okay, it has a laser rangefinder that goes out to 25 kilometers. Night vision camera can be magnified, uh, let's see, to 0.7 field of view, matched to IR field of views. Uh, so this is what I use to try and uh, mill size these things is 0.7. The radar I believe you can see just right at the top here is a sea giraffe radar. So it spins. So this is the sea giraffe. Maybe I can, you can see it up here. It's not a very good picture, but uh, you see it there spinning. It's made by Saab. So key features, simultaneous multi-mission functionality, supreme detection range for high-speed targets and small RCS surface targets. So like bullets and missiles coming towards it. High update rate, one second target revisit time. So that's why it's spinning, which is interesting. So Sea Giraffe AMB provides superior overall performance compared to other Naval 3D radars in the same class, provides the most comprehensive electronic counter countermeasure capabilities currently available, including ultra low antenna side low. Sea Giraffe operates at the C band and offers outstanding performance in both littoral regions and blue waters with 360 degree monitoring, high update rate, and a one second target revisit time. Excellent small target detection, extensive electronic counter countermeasures, small footprint. So this is a very, very advanced radar. This is what I would want on my ship. So this ship is the whole package, right? It's stealthy, you know, it doesn't have a lot of things sticking out of it that bounce off radars. Um, you know, it's very fast, trimarine, this thing's super fast, stealthy, so newer, newer systems and it's listening and, and that radar is gonna know where everything is. You know, it can track inbound missiles, you know, high-speed missiles, it can track uh, surface torpedoes, most likely. And this radar is integrated with the FLIR. So it's integrated and they will point together. So the radar will tell the FLIR where to look and then the FLIR you will identify and then you uh, engage. Uh, and then we have the control system here. So this is a simulated bridge, 
But this is what the bridge would look like. This guy's here overseeing. Okay, this is some sort of a console here, console here, and then you may have navigation guys, uh, offensive, maybe defensive operators, etc. So in here, we have our FLIR image on one screen, and then we have our radar. So on that spinning radar uh, is on this screen. And then this screen would be, I think, communications info. Uh, I believe this is like ship systems information. Initial thermal video is being filmed just with a camera, a uh, handheld camera onto this screen. And then the radar is gonna be, the first video released by Jeremy Corbell is gonna be uh, just a picture of this screen in the actual bridge. And then it's all filmed on a handheld camera. Here and there, you can actually hear he clicks or he has to physically push a button or whoever's filming has to physically push a button to actually zoom in. So this camera, it's not like an iPhone. Uh, it's some sort of camera that has a physical click zoom and finding that what type of camera that is will will give more information i, I kind of hit a stopping point with that moving on while why is all this stuff integrated let's talk aliens in this case made up aliens the ship really reminds me of predator from the movie predator season infrared right which is is scary to us because it can see things that we can't see but everything is linked, okay? So he sees an infrared, but you'll notice actually his gun, the way it actually is linked is he actually <laughs> shoot a laser at it to paint the target. Uh, and then he links his other fighting system, there's a shooting system actually shoots the laser. You have to actually detect and identify the target w with something. And usually in a ship, that's going to be its radar. So your radar is gonna pick out where the threats are coming from. And now you're gonna target it with something else. And in this case, the ship will use the phalanx radar, or I think the FLIR in some manner to identify it. And now you can shoot the missiles or you can shoot uh, the phalanx. This also brings up signature management. Uh, I've had a few subscribers ask, what is signature management? It is managing your signature, okay, a camouflage. So in optical, the visible realm, we're used to camouflage as managing our signature. In the infrared realm, in this case, Schwarzenegger uses mud, okay, that covers his signature of his infrared signature, the Predator uses whatever made up technology to do uh, optical signature management, so cloaking. <laughs> it's moving on. Okay, so let's get to the first video. This is the Omaha. We can write a general lat long where we're at. Is there? And then uh, the number of contacts you got, the course and speed leaders off of them. You know what I mean? In relative position to us, the bearings. Again, this is the radar video. It's hard to read. There's not much you can actually make out that I could could actually make out. I think it's on a 12 nautical mile scope. Okay, so this is the ship. I believe it's driving west southwest. Okay, so this is the center and it's got that spinning sea radar uh, or a group of ships in their group. And if this is a 12 nautical mile scope, okay, I think it's 12 miles out to here, then these are five mile range rings. So there's another ship basically to the northwest. Uh, I would say this is about seven and a half, eight nautical miles or, or a group of ships. Okay, there's something returning radar, radar hits, radar energy here. Uh, and it's not land because land would be much bigger. Okay, this, I think this is, this is a ship. So it looks like there are other contacts and these are contacts, okay? And I believe this could be the altitude. I believe this is the altitude. Again, it's hard to make out, but for each one of these tracks, like here's these three tracks that are surrounding or nearby this ship, okay? Within, uh, let's see, four nautical miles and this is about six nautical miles away. If you look at these tracks, okay, this is your actual radar track. Receives radar energy back from the mystery wire report. It was S and X band. And then it's going to start building a track file. And then it's gonna, as long as it keeps seeing the same return back, however the processing works in the radar, now it's gonna actually put on the screen that there is a track, okay? Cause it's getting other hits out there uh, as we go along. But now it's gonna put, it's gonna build a track file and it's gonna put a little number here. And that's what you'll hear when, when he's talking. He says, okay, track 781, uh, et cetera. And that is this little track number here that I'm unable to read uh, based on the, the clarity of the video. So the Omaha now, it looks like there's three tracks relatively off the nose. Okay, so in the direction of travel. And then it looks like there's another uh, contact over here that's higher up around this ship. I could actually make out the coordinates uh, playing through. Might be helpful too. Eyes up. Eyes up. Right. Nip up to make train track. Make train track as best you can. Track 781 just sped up to 46 knots. 781's a track. 50 knots. Closing in. 
Okay, now jump forward again. 138 knots for this one. That one's pretty much perfectly zero, zero, zero relative, right? Yeah. Okay, so that, he says 138 knots, and if we look at this actual contact, okay, right off the nose of the ship, uh, zero, zero, zero relative. So relative is to us. So they're talking about this contact. So this contact in particular is tracked going 138 knots. Here we have eight to nine contacts on the scope at the same time, but no other ship. So it's a, it's a later time frame. So if we look here, if I move it now, you can see the, the actual ship up in the northeast there, uh, you can see as it's changing uh, relative position to us. Okay, but I want you to watch here. You have three contacts around the Omaha, and then you have three contacts around moving, and these around this other ship. And look, these two contacts essentially disappear, okay? And I believe that what they're doing is actually going into the water. We have three contacts around the Omaha, and then Boom, boom, they go into the water. Radar, I believe that's coming from this. And now, normally you can cue the radar onto, you, t you target the radar into a contact, and now the other sensors are also linked, just like the Predator, right? It's gonna link everything. Everything's looking at that target area. Uh, it's slaved. So now let's go to the thermal video, which is just, you know, blows my mind. So thermal video, we'll go through, watch it uh, in more detail, but I just wanna talk through what we're looking at here, okay? So this is that IR image, so infrared image from the Sapphire. And reading across the top now, what you can see is uh, it is in a track, okay? So now it has a valid track. This is black hot, so anything shown up as dark is hotter than its surroundings. I cannot read this, but this right here is very important. This says UNFOV, so ultra narrow field of view. So that means it's zoomed in as far as the pod uh, can be zoomed in. And you'll see a previous zoom here if I go back here, okay? So I believe it doesn't show up actually up on the, on the top of the scope, but I believe this is in narrow field of view. So this is a narrow field of view, and then it's a digital zoom, okay? So it's digital, not optical. It's a digital zoom to ultra narrow field of view, okay? So it doesn't improve the quality of the image, uh, but it just makes it larger on the screen. So I think this is your ultra narrow field of view. What I wanna highlight here, these, these crosses, these crosses are the, tar the FLIR system is saying that there's a targetable object here. It thinks there is a target and then they command a lock and now it has a track. So the FLIR system is tracking this stable track, it looks like. I don't see it break or anything. Um, other information we can get from this uh, is the time and location. Okay, so down here in the, on the bottom left of the scope is you have the lat long. And on the bottom right of the scope, we actually get time. So you'll see here 553. Uh, and that will go through, this is basically an eight minutes. You can go to later and you can see the time, bottom right here is at six. So that's six o'clock Zulu. If we use a Zulu time converter, which I recommend, cause I've never messed this up. It is minus seven actually from Zulu to San Diego is minus seven hours. So 6 a.m. on the 16th of July minus seven is 11 p.m. at night. Just like George said. So if we go, we can now get the moon information. Uh, so the moon, if you look at the 15th here, this is from timeanddate.com, July 15th. 2019 and if we go to 11 p.m. at 11 p.m. the moon is 31 degrees above the horizon bearing 158 south southeast so it's and it's going to be very bright so this is high alum so this is a full moon here 97 percent illumination so you want like a medium amount of light medium illumination otherwise it tends to blow out the gogs the FLIR now you know the IR sapphire works during the day so it's not as affected by sunlight during those three to four days was relatively bright at night. So this is off the coast of San Diego. This is actually where it took place. Reading the radar scope, okay? This is where the radar video actually took place. 20 miles south of this island, San Clement Island. There's no time on the radar, so I, I couldn't get a time associated with it. But what I did get was off the thermal image where the boat was uh, when the orb goes, it appears to go in the water, was 40 miles uh, west of where the original radar video was so most likely uh, a few hours later, or I read the lat longs uh, incorrectly. So this is where the thermal video takes place, uh, right here. And this thermal video, man, just is unbelievable. Let's check it out. Okay, so 
What we're looking at here, okay, we have azimuth and elevation. This, this little dot here shows uh, that the azimuth from the ship, okay, is basically right off the nose. So azimuth is 1.5. So this orb is right basically off the nose of the ship. Uh, and if we look at elevation as well, elevation is 0 0.4. And this, the elevation, if we just watch that number down here in the bottom right, uh, it actually seems to change with, with the ship. So with the listing of the ship, it seems to change. So I didn't believe it was trustworthy. So initially looking at this video, I honestly thought these were uh, stars initially. But then if you look, um, he slews the pod and they stay on the screen. You'll see here, he actually moves the pod. So I believe these are actually dead pixels uh, in the FLIR. So that is a common thing. So I don't see any stars in the background, okay, which implies to me that there is, this is a high light environment. So th there's actually a lot of light here. Initially I thought it was, you know, pitch black, no moon, uh, but actually after analyzing the video, I think you do actually have, you see over here, it's, it's, it's light. And there's a lot of light actually in the atmosphere. Okay, so this is actually, it's a bright night. Um, the lighting is super critical for night vision devices. And this is your north arrow. So this points north, meaning the ship's aiming to the west. Took off. Okay. And now he commands a track. And you'll see here, it goes from, there's a, there's a break, there's a gap in the recording. And he'll switch actually to the others. I think, I think the cameraman walks around whoever's sitting at the console, whoever's controlling the console, and he starts filming from the other side. Frank Omaha, pick me kid, Rafael Peralta's the pass ability to launch Hilo ASAP. Okay, and as we're watching this thing, it is just hovering there. I don't think this thing is moving. I think it's just sitting there, like, not moving in 31 knots of wind. So let's hear this. Let's listen. We're making chance we can probably bring that 35 relative wind in the bunker. Sir. Yeah, bring it down. We got some, a lot of white water up there, so six foot swells. Whoa, it's getting close. <clears throat> Yeah, we have a uh, 31 knots sustained wind, yeah. top side, gust of 40. Uh, what was splashed? splashed? Splashed. Mark bearing and range. So 31 knots of sustained wind, top side. That is a lot. Gusting to 40 is what I hear. So that's gale force winds. They also mention six foot swells. Okay, so if you have a swell height of six feet, your actual wave height uh, is going to be higher, up to closer to 15 feet. I think that's because from top to bottom. Uh, where swell only counts from the middle of the wave up to uh, the crest. So I think these waves in this video are actually going to be around uh, closer to 15 feet. So 31 knots of wind, high wind out there, 6 foot swells, which means a 15 foot wave height. So using the environmental information and how it actually goes into the water here, I can show you how I'm able to estimate the size, shape, and distance of this thing. Okay, first thing is how high is the actual camera? But the Omaha length independence class littoral combat ship is 418 feet long. Let's round that up to 420 feet. So then how do we estimate how high it is, how high the camera is? So in order to estimate how high the camera is, if you take this distance, okay, 420 feet, and now you measure uh, basically up to here, now you can get an estimate, which was high, I thought. From that, I got 80 feet. Uh, other ways you can do it, you can measure a person here, okay, a person's around a little less than two meters, right? And then along the center, you can estimate up uh, how high this little FLIR pod is. That, I got a 56 feet, so quite a bit difference, quite a big variable. Cut it in half from 80 uh, and in half end up at 69. So why is this important? Okay, so why do they put this up high? Is so they can see, oh, see far, right, over the curve, curvature of the earth. Throughout the whole video, we get LRF arm. So this is your laser range finder. So that range finder I talked about out to 25 kilometers, it's armed, but it shows no return. Uh, and there's no indication in this video that it's been fired in the video uh, because it would turn red and would say uh, laser fire. It says no return, meaning at some point prior to this video or maybe in between where there's that gap, you'll notice, um, there is a gap right here where it swaps, right? We're, we're looking from the left side and now it goes around to the right side, the camera. In that gap, 
right, from here to there, uh, they could have fired the laser and gotten no return. We, we don't know. Anyway, at, at some point, the laser was fired and got no response back. And this thing, from my calculations, definitely within uh, 25 kilometers. So should have received a laser return uh, to give the range, but it didn't for whatever reason. So when the orb goes into the water, or when the object goes into the water, you'll see it's... Splash, 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 splash. The horizon is still in focus. Is still in view, right? It's basically one object, one object height below the horizon is when it actually goes down, right? If, if the object's very close, then I would expect that we would see ocean behind this, right? If you're looking down at something close to the ship, you would see, sh you see ocean, this would all be ocean, right? But since we're looking at something on the horizon, almost on the horizon now, this thing's further away. So how do we calculate how far? This is probably the biggest room for error in my calculations. Uh, but what I did was, as I went out to uh, near my house, this local beach, uh, and I basically found a point, right? So I was able to find a point, which is right here. And if I go to the altitude, that is 21 meters high. So using Google Earth, I was able to determine that this height in reality is 21 meters, this spot right here, right, right by my house, okay? 21 meters. So then I went to that spot. <laughs> it's in Praia Porto de Mosh, and yes, <laughs> this is where I live. It's amazing. I get to that exact spot in Praia de Mosh, and now I know how far these objects are, okay, using Google Earth. So I can say this is half a mile. This is one mile. The point is at 1.25 nautical miles, okay? So if you look, if there's an object that's going into the sea right here, okay, like this ship, Okay, we will have quite a bit of, of C behind it. So what I believe is, is that the object is actually further out. So if I go right to that spot and I measure, basically the absolute horizon is 5.5 miles. So I don't think it's any further than say six miles at the most. And it, I don't think it's any closer than two miles. So I'd put it right around three to four nautical miles, maybe a little further, but let's say four nautical miles. So I think it's three to four nautical miles, probably closer to four nautical miles uh, away. That's how I ranged it. So if we can range it then, now what can we do? From the data spec sheet, the ultra narrow field of view is 0.7, like I showed before. So using the 60 to one rule, if this thing is three nautical miles away, we get a field of view of 210 feet. So that's how wide the whole camera is. And so you can measure, uh, and I measured, again, using just a screen reference, is 12 feet. So if it's three miles away, it'll be 12 feet wide by seven feet high is what I measured. Uh, if it's four nautical miles away, which is I think it's closer to four nautical miles away, then the field of view of the screen of the camera is 280 feet. And that would make this object 10 feet across and six feet vertical. And if you look at it, it's not, uh, it's not a, a circle, you know, it's, it's, it's an oval. You know, if you look at this thing, it's, it's a oval. It's very rarely, you know, right when it goes into the water, it looks more circular to me, but that could be from the water affecting uh, how it actually looks. Imagine 31 knots, I mean, gale force winds with the waves and this thing just goes right into the water. I mean, I think it's just right out the, the nose of the ship. You know, they're just watching this thing from like four miles away and it just goes right into the water. Could you imagine seeing that? I mean, you don't know what it is. Like people on the ship don't know what it is. How do you know it won't like start shooting or something from, from underneath? But we're far away, so four nautical miles. It's zoomed in and then digitally zoomed in again. So more than optically. So that's why you do get some some graininess to the video. It's just because we're so zoomed in. Uh, but you can still make out the waves, okay? So this is one wave. Uh, you know, I think this is your swells that you see go through here, okay? So you can see the waves basically going from right to left across the screen. And the first kind of wave, this is the coolest picture to me. You can see the first wave kind of hit the bottom of the object right here. It looks so cool. So that's like the top of the waves, I believe. And then if we just go frame by frame here, next frame is basically getting under the wave and then you'll see a splash basically come up. So I think it hits, it's splashing around. So you're, you're starting to see the, the 15 foot wave 
uh, is basically impacting through the middle of the object. And then it's gone. So it's not much. As soon as it hits there, then there's just a couple more frames in between. Now the full wave hits it. And I think you're getting splash around, around the object. I mean, if it's circular shaped or if it's shaped like a sphere, the water's just gonna go over it and then that's it. The temperature of this thing should be same as the water, it's gone. And it seems like it almost tracks it underwater there for a little bit more. Not sure if it does or not. And then we get no return and then LRF uh, does not show arm because there's no nothing to track. So that's it for that video. Uh, the third and final video is going to be the optical video. So this video, there's not a lot of reference. So I don't know what the camera is and that really limited what I could do. If I knew the exact field of view of the camera, I think I could get more information. Uh, but for this video, I kind of went through two major phases. This is the first phase. I think there is quite a bit of information here. If we show it's that same color that that incompatible MVG lighting, that red orange color. And then you see look like two points of lights, so almost two lights just staying there uh, motionless. Again, there's no horizon reference, there's no background references. So hard to make too much out of it. But if we make some assumptions, okay, so speculation here, uh, but if this is the same object that we saw, which I would argue it's definitely likely, then if we make a measurement, say that's around 10 feet now, if this is 10 feet across, now we can put a stake in the ground that that is 10 feet and now we can make some other uh, references. Just weird light, right? It's, that, it's not really flashing, but it's like pulsating. So this is the second phase. This is those, those two together and now we'll see a third light I've seen Jeremy mention this could be an aircraft, but again, it does just does not look like an aircraft to me. I don't know, you know, an aircraft I would expect to see some breakout of light, some breakout, especially in the visible spectrum. Should be able to break out. There's like separate sources of the light, but it looks like it comes from the same location. That's why the Chinese lantern seems to, to work because it, it diffuses the light. So what could I get out of that video? I'll show you what I was able to do. So I basically took the start of uh, the video and I, I said that's 10 feet. And now if you use 10 feet as the reference and you measure between those two and the first part of the video, you get 240 feet is actually between them as a reference, right? If you use a stake in the ground of 10 feet for the size. So then that would, that would pin this to 240 feet. Sorry, I don't know the field of view of the actual camera, so I can't tell you how far away this, this is, uh, or at least that's where I got hung up on uh, in my analysis. So I outlined here where those were, and then this was at time 23 seconds, this was the start um, of the moving one up above, okay? And then at time 29 seconds, he ends up here, and at the end, he ends up over here at uh, 33 seconds. So if we use that as a reference, okay, this is 240 feet. <laughs> Starts here at 23 and then goes there to 33 and we measure, okay, it does look like this third one is actually closer. So that would make, uh, it, it's actually going, it would be slower than my calculations. But from my calculations, I said it goes from here to there. If this is 10 feet, that is 240 feet, which makes this 2,300 feet. So it goes 2,300 feet in 10 seconds, 60 seconds to a minute. 60 minutes in an hour, one nautical mile, 6,000 feet. We cancel out the feet, we cancel out the seconds, we cancel out the minutes, and we're left with nautical miles an hour. Add all this, multiply all this up, and then divide all this out. This is normal uh, chemistry math. If you don't know how to do this, it will uh, help you hugely in life and math. And we get up with 138 miles per hour, which I was like, wow, that's what he said on the, on the radio. Uh, no, that's, he said knots, right? 138 knots, that's more around 160 miles an hour. So 138 miles an hour, remember this is a estimate based on the size of 10 feet and the actual uh, moving, the moving uh, UAP uh, appears closer. So I would say this is a conservative estimate. So it's going maximum of 138 miles an hour. 
which makes sense if we look at what was given as the max speeds was uh, 40 uh, up to 138 knots, I believe, 40 knots up to 138 knots. And also for the Aguadilla UAP from 70 to 120 miles per hour, I believe. So very uh, surprisingly similar. As far as the flashing on this optical video, I covered that before. You basically have a 1.25 seconds, then it goes 1.75 seconds, back to 1.25 seconds, 1.75 seconds. That is outside the normal strobe pattern of a airliner, or what's allowed, uh, which should be uh, no lower than 40 flashes per minute. And this is, that would be less than, that would be 34 flashes per minute if you have a break of 1.75 seconds in between flashes. So huge help to Dave Fouch, thermal expert. Great thanks to Dave. Please check out his YouTube channel. Hopefully I'll be working with him in the future. And my, that's my question for Mick West and the debunkers is how do you explain this? You know, how do you explain this orb tracked by so many different systems, uh, three different corroborating sources? How do you explain it? I don't know if it is explainable. That's no Chinese lantern that can sit in 31 knots of uh, sustained wind. What's going on in, over there in the Catalina Islands? I mean, that just seems insane to me. What are these orbs? This Google Earth project is in the description, so you can find this for yourself. Link in the description. This is where the, the location I got from the thermal coordinates. And then based off of where it went down here, this is four nautical miles, so if you m measure three, uh, to six here. So basically, my estimate is that the orb or whatever the object is went into the water around this location. So I don't know what these striations are, what they mean. Do these actually mean anything? So again, crazy stuff going out there in the Catalina Islands. So questions I have moving forward is, uh, what kind of camera was it? Do we know the exact camera? Now we can give pretty accurate readings actually on the speeds uh, of the optical video. Why is there no laser response? Did they fire a laser at it? That would be another question I have. Did they try and get a laser range finding for sure solution and they just couldn't get it? Amazing video guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Please like and subscribe. I've reached out Jeremy Corbell. I've asked him to review the video. He's happy to review it and give a response. So hopefully we'll have him on uh, the next show. Special thanks to Natty Wallow. Thanks for your uh, comment. I thought it was a great idea to make this video. So thanks for that. Thanks everybody for watching. Please like and subscribe. Greatly helps the channel and have a great day. Peace.